Hi, welcome to our complete lecture on the introduction to simple regressions. This is the first of a two-part lecture series, with a second lecture covering multiple regression analysis. There is little in assumed knowledge, except that you've watched our 14-minute YouTube preview clip entitled The Easiest Introduction to Regressions. If so, then we're good to go. For the sake of continuity, we'll follow on from the wages and education example from our YouTube clip. Now, the first concept we're going to discuss is the population regression. Recall that the population includes every observation possible. So in this example, the population is everyone in the entire world. Now, recall that a sample regression was a line of best fit for the sample of respondents we've surveyed. Well, the population regression line is simply the line of best fit using everyone in the population. Suppose we plot everyone in the entire population's wages and education on the scatter graph. This means everyone in the entire world. The line of best fit for the population is our population regression line. So the population regression line is a regression line using the entire population of observations. The regression line is denoted as follows. Beta 0 is the intercept term and beta 1 is a slope coefficient. I'd like to now talk about the distinction between the dependent and independent variable. The dependent variable is a variable whose values depend on the other variable. In contrast, the independent variable is a variable whose values are independent or do not depend on the other variable. So you, as a researcher, will have to think of the logic behind the relationship you're testing and see which variable is likely to depend on the other and which variable moves independently of the other. Okay, let's try to figure this out for our wages and education example. Now, is it plausible for causality to run from education to wages? Well, it seems to make sense, right? The more education you have, the smarter you are, the better the jobs you're qualified for and hence better pay. Let's see if causality runs the other way. The more you're paid in wages leads you to being more educated. This to me doesn't make sense. I have, say, 15 years of education. If I suddenly receive an increase in my wage, I still only have 15 years of education. I can't go back in time and change the number of years of education I've acquired. So it doesn't seem plausible that wages affects education. So in this case, wages is a dependent variable as its values change according to education. And education is the independent variable as its values are independent to changes in wages. Finally, when setting up the regression equation, the dependent variable is always on the left side of the regression equation, and the independent variable is on the right side of the regression equation. When displaying our data points and regression line on a scatter graph, the dependent variable is on the y-axis, and the independent variable is on the x-axis. So in our example, wages is on the y-axis, and the independent variable, which is education, is on the x-axis. Depending on the textbook you're using and your course instructor, the dependent variable can also be referred to as a response, endogenous, or regressive variable. Similarly, the independent variable can also be referred to as the explanatory, exogenous, or regressor variable. Suppose we have the following population regression line. Now, recall that the population is assumed to be unobservable as it's infinitely large. It's too costly or time-consuming for us to go out and survey every person in the entire world. So in effect, this population regression line is unobservable. However, we can estimate the population regression line with our sample regression line. That is, we take a random sample of individuals from the population, say 50 people, and record their wages and education values and estimate the sample regression. If the sample is large enough, and if the observations are randomly selected, then the sample regression line should be a good approximation of the population regression line. This is similar to how in our previous lectures, we use the sample mean as an approximation of the population mean. The population regression is a true relationship between wages and education, whereas the sample regression is only a sample estimate of that relationship. The sample regression line is denoted as wages equals to beta hat 0 plus beta hat 1 times education. The hat on top of the betas tells us that they are estimates of the population betas. Or the sample regression line could also look like this. Here the little b's are estimates of the population betas. How the sample regression line is written depends on your textbook or your instructor's preferences.
The main thing to remember is that the population regression line is not observable, as we need all observations in the entire population to calculate it. However, the population regression line is a true relationship between your dependent and independent variables. And the sample regression line is observable, as we calculate it using our sample of observations. It's used as our estimate of the population regression line. Recall from hypothesis testing that we had a population that is infinitely large, and we were interested in the population mean. However, the population mean was not observable, as we could not observe the entire population. So what did we do? Well, we took a random sample from the population and calculated the sample mean. And using the sample mean, we could make estimates or inferences about the population mean. Now, in terms of regressions, we cannot observe the population regression, but we can observe the sample regression. And so we have an estimate and can make inferences on the population regression line. How do we make inferences again? Good old hypothesis testing. Time for a quick refresher on residuals. Suppose we have our scatter graph of our sample of respondents, and we fit a sample regression line. Now, suppose the sample regression equation is as follows. Let's make a prediction for one of our respondents, Sally, who has 13 years of education. Based on our regression line, this person is expected to earn a wage of $18. How did we figure this out? Simple. We substitute 13 for education, so 5 plus 1 times 13 equals to $18. However, Sally's actual wage lies above our prediction. She actually earns $21 per hour. This error in our regression model's estimate is known as a residual, and it's calculated as the actual wage minus the predicted wage. This hat here means it's a prediction. So Sally's residual is 21 minus 18, which is $3. Perhaps Sally has an excellent attitude towards work that has helped her get promoted. Now, suppose Peter has 15 years of education. Based on our model, he's expected to earn $20 an hour. However, his actual wage in the data set is $18 per hour. So his residual is equal to minus $2. Perhaps Peter has no experience in his current job and so earns slightly less than was predicted by the model. The sample regression equation can be written like this, where mu hat, it's a Greek symbol that looks like a U, represents the residuals. The residuals contain other factors that affect wages, but are not included in the model. This may include factors such as experience, IQ, and height. True story, height actually affects your ability to get promoted. I wasn't very happy when I learnt about this. I'd like to now introduce the error term. Suppose we have the entire population on the graph, and let's imagine the population regression line. I say imagine because in reality, the population regression line is not observable. Similar to the residual, the error term is the difference between the actual wage and the population regression line. However, since the population regression is unobservable, then so too is the error term. This is because the error term is calculated using the population regression line. The error term informs us as to how well the regression explains the data. Large error terms means that the model isn't that great at explaining the data and making predictions and small error terms means it's a good model and makes accurate predictions. But we can't observe the error terms. No worries. We can use the residuals as estimates of the error terms, just like how we use the sample mean as an estimate of the population mean. Later in this lecture, I'll introduce a measure called the R-square statistic. This uses the residuals of the sample regression model and tells us exactly how well the model explains the data. The error term is often denoted as mu or epsilon. The residuals are denoted as mu hat or epsilon hat. In our lectures, we will use mu. So mu hat is an estimate of mu. Remember, the hats mean that these are the sample estimates. So from now on, we will use mu when referring to the error term, and the residual will be expressed as mu hat. The best way to learn regressions is through a worked example. Question one. You survey 40 random people and record down their current hourly wage and the number of years of education. You estimate a simple regression line and the output is as follows. Now, don't freak out just yet. I know it looks like upside down Chinese, which may actually be easier for some of you, but it's not as hard as it looks. We're going to break this down into little pieces as we work through this example. A. What is the sample regression line? B. If Sam has 12 years of education, what is your prediction of his hourly wage? C. Is there a statistically significant relationship between wages and education? 
These questions may seem daunting, but they're actually pretty straightforward. You just have to get used to the jargon and style of exam questions. So part A, what is a sample regression line? First, we're dealing with a sample regression because we're conducting this analysis on a sample of 40 randomly selected individuals. Recall that the sample regression line looks like this. The beta coefficients have hats on them as they are sample estimates of the population regression line. The sample regression line looks something like this. Beta hat 0 is the intercept term, and refers to the point at which the sample regression line intercepts the y-axis. A high value for beta hat 0 looks like this, and a small value looks like this. Beta hat 1 refers to the slope of the sample regression line, and if you recall from high school, the slope is rise over run. A large positive value of beta hat 1 would make the regression line look like this, as the slope of the line is steeper, and a small beta hat 1 value would look like this, as the regression line is flatter. So back to the question, what is the sample regression line? Well, basically, this question is asking us to write down beta hat 0 and beta hat 1. Let's look at the regression output table again. The section of the table that contains the beta hat coefficients is here. More specifically, these values here under the label coefficients. The first term is beta hat 0, that's why it says intercept here, as it's the intercept of the sample regression line. The second term is beta hat 1, and its label says education. This is because education is the x variable in the regression equation, so beta hat 1 is the slope or the effect of education on the y variable. So substituting these estimated values in the sample regression equation gives us this. This is the estimated line of best fit, as calculated by Excel, for the 40 data points in our sample. If Sam has 12 years of education, what is your prediction of his hourly wage? Well, first, we have to write down the estimated regression line, as we did in Part A. This tells us how to make predictions for wages, based on someone's education level. All we have to do is insert the person's education level here, and calculate the value for wages. So in Sam's case, we substitute 12 for education, and his estimated wage is 3.33 plus 1.47 times 12. This gives us $20.97. So based on Sam's level of education, we predict his wage to be $20.97 per hour. This is what we expect, given the information we have about his education. Part C. Is there a statistically significant relationship between wages and education? Now, what do we mean by this? Well, we have to ask ourselves, what would the population regression line look like if there was no relationship between wages and education? If we draw the regression line, and there is a positive relationship between wages and education, it should look like this and have a positive slope coefficient. And if there is a negative relationship, it should look like this with a negative slope coefficient. So if there is no relationship between wages and education, the regression line should be flat, like so. And the slope of the regression line, rise over run, will look like this. That is, when there is no relationship, the slope coefficient, beta 1, is equal to 0. So what we have to do now is to use hypothesis testing to determine if the population regression slope coefficient is equal to zero, based on what we observe from the sample regression line. Recall that we should use a statistical significance level of 5% unless otherwise stated. Let's go back to our Excel regression output. You can see here that we have, for each coefficient estimate, standard errors, t-statistics, and p-values. These should look familiar. In fact, they should remind you of hypothesis testing. But what is the test? What exactly are we testing for? What is a null hypothesis? And what's the alternate hypothesis? By default, all statistics software packages conduct the following hypothesis test on the regression coefficients. The sample slope coefficient, beta hat 1, is equal to 0. This means there is no relationship between wages and education, and so the true population regression line is horizontal, like so. Or that beta hat 1 is not equal to 0. This means there is a relationship between education and wages. So, for example, the true population regression line may look like this instead. Okay, so looking at the output, and specifically looking at the row for education. This relates to the coefficient of beta hat 1, which is the slope of the regression line. That is, this will tell us whether there is a relationship or not between wages and education. By default, all statistical software packages conduct this hypothesis test. 
whether the beta coefficient is equal to zero or not equal to zero. That is, whether there is a relationship between x and y in the population. Now, don't worry. All the hard work in solving this hypothesis test has been done for you by Excel. All we have to do is look at the corresponding p-value. Now, recall from our hypothesis testing lectures that if the p-value is higher than your significance level, or alpha, we don't reject the null hypothesis. If the p-value is smaller than alpha, we do reject the null hypothesis. Looking at the table, we see that the p-value for beta hat 1 is this number here. Now, what does this mean? For those of you not familiar with scientific notation, let me quickly explain. This negative sign, here, means that this number is smaller than zero by many decimal places. How many decimal places? Well, five decimal places to be exact. So we need to push the decimal place five times to the left. So this gives us 0 0.00001767711, which is a very small number. We can check and confirm that the original number is smaller by five decimal places. Recall that the significance level for this equation is 5%. So the p-value is smaller than alpha, 5%, and we reject the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis states that there is no relationship between wages and education. Therefore, we reject the null hypothesis and conclude that there is a statistically significant relationship at the 5% level. This means that the more education a person has, on average, they should accrue a higher hourly wage. What do we mean by a statistically significant relationship? You'll hear this a lot when dealing with regressions. In short, it means that there is a true causal relationship between x and y that is not simply due to sampling variation or sampling error. It's a true relationship between x and y. Now, to fully understand what I mean, we need to discuss the standard error of beta hat. Some of you may recall the standard error from my lectures on hypothesis testing. The standard error in regression analysis is very similar to that in hypothesis testing. Let me explain. Recall that we're using a sample of observations. Why? Because the population is too large. But what's the drawback of using a sample? Well, there may be sampling variation present. That is, a sample may not perfectly reflect the population due to noise and randomness in the sample selection process. Suppose we have the following population regression line. It's a dotted line as it's unobservable. But let's assume for now that we can see it. Now, imagine we grab a random sample of individuals and estimate the following regression line. It's pretty close to the population line, right? Now, suppose we resample from the population and estimate another sample regression line. And suppose we draw another random sample from the population and estimate a third regression line. Notice that all the sample regression lines were very close together. In fact, they were all very close to the population regression line. Thus, there were good estimates of the population regression. In this case, the sample beta estimates had a low standard error. It's a measure of how consistent the sample beta hats would be if we resampled over and over again. It's a measure of the amount of sampling variation when estimating beta. Now, suppose instead the sample regressions look like this. You can see that in this case, the sample regressions are not similar at all. There is a high level of sampling variation, and the beta hat estimates differ markedly from one sample to the other. So there is a high standard error for beta hat in this case. The standard error of a coefficient tells us how much sampling variation there is if we were to resample and re-estimate beta. It's an indication of how reliable the sample estimates are in our sample regression output. Suppose we estimate, using our sample of individuals, that the slope coefficient for wages and education is equal to 1. The question of statistical significance is this. Is 1 sufficiently large enough for us to conclude that this represents a true relationship between wages and education? Or is 1 too close to 0 and thus likely to be caused by sampling variation and randomness? That is, is 1 sufficiently different from 0 for us to conclude a non-zero relationship between wages and education? Well, suppose the standard error is 0.2. In this case, an estimated beta of 1 is 5 standard errors away from 0, which means it's pretty far away from 0. This is evidence that the population beta is not equal to 0, and that there is a real relationship between wages and education. However, suppose instead that the standard error is 2, then a beta hat of 1 is only half a standard error away from 0. This means it's very close to 0, 
This is evidence that the population beta is likely to be zero, and that there is no real relationship between wages and education. You can see that the standard error is vitally important in determining whether there is a true relationship between X and Y in the population, as it gives us a sense of how far our sample beta estimates are from zero. Okay, time for a pop quiz. How do we know for sure whether the number of standard errors away from zero is large or small? That is, how many standard errors until we conclude that sample beta hat is too close to zero? Well, we use the critical value. It tells us the number of standard errors needed for a sample coefficient to be statistically significant. That is, for it to be statistically different from zero. We've previously covered the critical value in my hypothesis testing lectures. Be sure to check it out if you're unsure about critical values. Statistically insignificant means that even though beta hat is non-zero, its true population value is likely to be zero. Back to our worked example. Part D. Is a constant term, beta hat zero, statistically significant? That is, is the estimate for beta hat too close to zero, or is it far enough from zero for us to conclude that the population intercept term is indeed non-zero? And part E. A study reported that every additional year in education results in a $2 or more increase in one's hourly wage. Test this claim at the 5% significance level. This is a classic hypothesis testing problem, which we'll go through step by step. So is a constant term statistically significant? That is, is beta zero or the constant term in the population regression a non-zero number? Let's look at the regression output again. Now, because we're talking about beta zero, which is the intercept term, we have to look at this row here. And again, because we're testing for statistical significance, we can just look at the p-value. Why? Because by default, Excel has already conducted this test, whether the population beta zero is equal to zero or not. That is, Excel has already tested for statistical significance of the beta coefficients. What do we mean by a statistically significant intercept term?